I'm assuming that most everyone here is a mobile developer or they know mobile developers or they're interested in the field of mobile development because that's basically what it's all about. So uh, the talk could also be called Write Once, Deploy Everywhere, Choosing Technologies in the Age of Mobile Applications. So this is kind of what, what we're all after, right? Uh, it's sort of the holy grail of, uh, of what's happening now in the world, tons of mobile phones, and we'd like to get on all those devices. So a um, little bit of an overview of the talk. I'll uh, introduce who I am and sort of what's my, in, what's my interest in all of this stuff. Um, what I've seen, so the other options that are out there, and just sort of talk about the pros and cons of them. Um, then I'll talk about why, why Adobe Air. So just a few, I mean, I, I don't think most of us need convincers about this, but uh, there, uh, there are some considerations uh, when you're choosing Air for, uh, for mobile development. And um, some performance issues. Just some quick development examples. Uh, if you're new to Air, um, these will be good for you. Just sort of show you just how simple things can be. Um, some performance tips, that'll be interesting for some people uh, who have had previous Air experience working with mobile. And a uh, little bit about what's broken at Adobe, or at least in my, in my humble opinion. And uh, what I'm excited about, so the things that are coming down the line that are really exciting for, for Air. Um, and just a quick summary. So that's the overview. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about who I am. So my name is Matt Lockyer. Um, that's my website. Uh, I do a lot of crazy uh, motion projects, visualizers, like lots of really robust particle systems in C++ and stuff uh, for my motion research at SFU. I have a Bachelor's of Computer Science from UBC. And uh, that's not a typo. It is a BA. It was a Bachelor's of Arts. So I took all visual arts electives, but uh, I majored in computer science. They let you do that. Um, it's kind of cool. And uh, yeah, I'm a PhD candidate at uh, the Interactive Arts and Technology School, or SEAT, at uh, SFU. So my background, I love graphics, I love programming, and I want my stuff to be everywhere. I want to get out to all these platforms. I want to build you know, tools for people to experience uh, new and exciting generative graphics and, and motion graphics. And uh, I'm, I was currently searching around for platforms about a year ago and, and things I could learn that would help me get on all these devices but still create really rich, uh, rich experiences. And uh, so my background with languages is pretty broad. Um, I, I've been, I, coded, <laughs> I coded a little C++ application when I was six. And I don't know. I had a tutor, though, so that was kind of helpful. But I played with like HyperCard and Max, so that's a little bit of history there. Um, and libraries I've used, uh, just tons of them. There's lots out there. And uh, yeah, libraries are, libraries are great. So this is sort of some of the motion projects that I've worked on or been involved with. The top left-hand corner is um, it's basically uh, uh, like a user a user study that we ran. Um, it's kind of more like a clinical study. Would you like to turn the lights off? Or yeah, it's lights off. That's perfect. Thank you. So um, that was a, a motion, a study in motion, uh, basically perception of motion, and it was self-reported judgments of motion. The top right is just a fun little connect project where you're sort of swimming through, swimming through motion, uh, little flocking, flocking boys and stuff. The bottom right is a project that I did. Uh, in Chile, I was hired to make a, like a Connect-based painting program. And then over here on the left is a new program I'm working on where you'll basically be painted into an image. So it's kind of um, still working with motion and uh, different motion types to paint video. And uh, we're currently working with that, doing some, doing some more uh, user studies with artists and designers and video game environment people. So uh, pretty fun stuff. Um, but let's talk about what I've seen. So we're all sort of, we're all probably Adobe Air people, but it is important to know, um, you know, what's out there. Uh, and maybe, you know, if, if another tool suits our needs, we might, we might want to sort of move to that. And I'm in no way, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm in no way a fanboy or anything, but uh, this talk is basically my opinion, and it's based on a lot of stuff that I've looked at. So 
I did look at Unity um, a long time ago, and I think Unity is uh, pretty amazing at what it does. Uh, it compiles natively to the big four and beyond, uh, obviously a lot more. I just, I'm kind of concerned with the big four because that's sort of what I want to hit. Um, design and development environment, uh, so it's mixed, so you can manage your assets, levels, scripts, prefabs. It comes with a lot of prefabs. It comes with a lot of libraries. That's great. Um, some of the cons, it's almost entirely game focused, so it's a, it's a game engine. Um, it's not a pure development environment, so you don't just open it up and get scripts and start to, uh, or sorry, you don't just open it up and start to make your own sort of classes and files. Um, cash for licenses, uh, it gets kind of pricey um, at the end of the day, but I guess, you know, if you're hoping to strike it, strike it big in the mobile space, then uh, I guess it doesn't matter to you, but uh, that's always a, a part, for, uh, sorry, that's always like a, kind of like a pain point for me is the, the cache because I like to just play with sort of free tools. Um, Corona SDK, uh, I'm sure we've kind of heard, of heard about it or if you haven't heard about it, it's basically a, it is a development environment. Uh, there's a simulator in the build environment. Uh, it's got native UI, hooks into the native UI for Android and iOS. Um, one thing that's not on here as one of the cons is actually it is only iOS and Android. So um, some more pros, Lewis script, it's sort of like ActionScript. They've got good physics library. They've got a moderate community and a very fast development workflow. Um, it's totally game focused, so you're just making games. Um, and there's an annual license. So Marmalade. Uh, not a lot of people have heard about Marmalade. It's, uh, you basically get to write in C++ and you use your existing development environments like Visual Studio Xcode. It's very, very serious. C++ is going to whine all the time and, you know, you got all those linking problems and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's used by the big boys, I put, uh, because serious people use it. Um, and uh, it's pretty good. It's basically just a bunch of, you know, libraries, frameworks, training, and customer support, and it's expensive. It's like the most priciest option out there. Um, but uh, obviously it's very robust. So uh, PhoneGap, we've heard of PhoneGap. They're here in Vancouver. Um, and, you know, they were acquired by Adobe. So uh, basically PhoneGap build is, is owned and operated by Adobe, but PhoneGap remains an open source project and, and fully open source uh, licenses. And um, it's got a large community, great documentations. You leverage basically everything that's out there with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which is awesome. So you get access to, you know, everything. And uh, cons, so... Uh, there's performance and appearance inconsistencies with web technologies. Um, there's web view limitations. So if you don't know how PhoneGap works, it's a web view inside your phone, and it's basically just running this, what, this web view that's available in most mobile devices, and it basically just throws up a website inside your application. And um, there are limitations to web views, and so uh, one of the key ones for people, if you're going to do anything, anything really rich with graphics, uh, your canvas rendering speed, it's, it's really horrid across platforms. Uh, I know on my Android phone it's pretty terrible. On some iPhones it's, it's great, like some of the newer ones. Um, but still, it's just not quite, it's just not quite there yet. Um, WebGL will come out, but again, because, because it's a web technology, you're going to see a lot of kind of disparity across devices and implementations because it's still seeded in web technologies. So cache for PhoneGap build, which is uh, the one that Adobe, Adobe's, um, Adobe's maintaining, and PhoneGap build is basically you take all your assets, all your files, upload it into the cloud, and they spit you out a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of apps that you can submit to the App Store or you can kind of go straight through their, their market and straight out to the markets. Um, so limited access to device features. So you basically use the PhoneGap implementations for the camera or what have you. Um, and if you don't want to use their implementation, you can code your own. So that's sort of where you would run up against a wall if you were making a very, very specific camera app or something like that. So PhoneGap's great though uh, if you want sort of simple app. And again, Titanium, it's a similar approach to PhoneGap, very similar in fact. And uh, 
basically you just have sort of the same sort of pros and cons. Um, it's Titanium's mainly, it's, uh, it's geared towards corporate clientele and um, yeah, they look, they look like just a, a more corporate version of PhoneGap. They're not, uh, they're not so open source and, and happy-go-lucky, but uh, basically uh, Titanium's, it's the, same, it's the same bag of stuff, so you're dealing with web technologies and sort of these embedded web views, so something to consider. So uh, also, there, there's just plain HTML5 and, whoops, <laughs> it's a little funny slide. So there's uh, HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript, and uh, the pros is you already know this stuff. It's free, it's open, it's, it's got the fastest workflows for just creating lists, views, all this stuff. Um, so organizing your content, I mean, if you just want sort of to do a to-do list app or something and you're, and you're not so focused on like the, the key the key um, sort of difference of your to-do list app is not, is not that it's super slick and gesture-based like that Clear app. Um, if you haven't heard of Clear, check it out for the iPhone. It's pretty cool looking. Um, but if your to-do list app is fairly straightforward and that's all you kind of want to do with your app, then, I mean, these are great options. But uh, if you want sort of, you know, really good performance, really rich experiences, really heavy on the graphics and slick with the, uh, with the UI, then, I don't know, it's, uh, it's going to take some time for this to come around. Um, so also if you just go with straight HTML5, uh, there is no app market. Um, so the canvas rendering inconsistencies across all platforms, this is going to happen with WebGL. Um, not every phone will implement WebGL perfectly. Um, so you're going to see some, some issues there, especially if you want to drill down into WebGL, start doing shader stuff, start getting really specific with your blending and stuff. It, it's going to end up happening. So that might create some headaches in the future. So this is the, uh, this is the problem. There's so many choices and so little time. Um, there are a lot of cool technologies out there. I personally am a developer, so I get really excited about the technologies that are out there and, and learning how to sort of master a new, a new technology. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you kind of got to pick, you kind of got to pick uh, basically what you, what you think will be the best horse in the race. And so um, in my opinion, I sort of hooked myself up to Adobe Air about a year ago and I'm actually a Flash developer making um, website sort of website uh, headers and banners and all sorts of stuff, not advertising banners, but like banners for people's websites and uh, things like that. But um, yeah, I, I'm a flasher from since I was 18, 19 and then sort of uh, got into serious app development and then I'm back uh, with Adobe Air sort of last year. I got really excited about it because I saw how easy it was to just develop, develop a, basically a Swift and then take the Swift and the XML file, smash it together, and it pops out an APK, and I load it onto my Android phone, and I get to experience it right away. And uh, I actually heard about it um, happening, and then I couldn't believe it, and then I tried it, and after about a day and a half, I had my first little touch application where I spewed out a bunch of particles out of my finger every time I touched the screen, and I was super, super excited. <laughs> so. Um, I chose Adobe Air and I chose to kind of learn all about it and see sort of what it could do for me. So why Adobe Air? Um, it's easy to learn or uh, you guys in the room, you already know it by default. And uh, there's simple deployment through the Adobe products. So if you're using Flash CS 5.5, Flash Builder, um, even the command line, it's not that difficult. Um, so uh, it's open source kind of. And what do I mean by that? Well. The players themselves are not open source, so the Flash player for the web is not open source. The actual Adobe Air runtime, it's not open source. Uh, you'll never be able to sort of get inside there and see what actually makes it work. Uh, you can just sort of guess at it. Um, but the thing that is open source is actually compiling to those players, so targeting those players. So all of the SDKs, they're all, uh, they're all open source. You can actually get in there. You can write your own compilers. Um, I mentioned Flash Develop because I personally use it. Uh, it's available for, for free for the PC, and Flash Develop is basically a really, really, really awesome uh, Flash development uh, environment. And uh, 
it's um, it's super slick. It's got a really low memory footprint and stuff. It runs super fast, and I've actually ran it for weeks and weeks and weeks, and it, it's never crashed. Um, and uh, Flash Develop it comes sort of set up like Flash Builder. It's sort of a, a very action script oriented development environment, and it helps you build to uh, any one of the mobile platforms that you might be targeting. Um, I'll just quickly mention Hacks because I was super impressed by this a year ago when I was sort of looking around at um, how, to, how to target the Flash Player and how to target the Adobe Air platform. Uh, Hacks is just a language that's supposed to be sort of multi-purpose for uh, developing applications that are C++ or targeting the Flash Player or whatever. Um, but it's actually written by some 26-year-old French kid and he's really into making Flash games on the web and uh, he's, he's like a prodigy. So uh, if you want to just waste, waste an hour, check out Hacks. It's a crazy community. Um, one thing about Hacks, though, is that they actually have made their own Flash compiler, and it, it compiles to lightning quick action script code. So if you're doing like really, really, really uh, optimized stuff, then you might want to look at that. But regular action script 3 is fine, fine for now. Um, so Adobe Air is free if you're clever. If you want to just use Flash Develop and you want to use the command line or uh, Flash Develop can actually build it for you now. They've gotten really good with their releases. Uh, their nightly builds and stuff are coming out and, and you can target the mobile platforms and it's, it's awesome. Um, and uh, you can do it all within Flash Develop. They'll show you how to set up your uh, XML descriptor file for, for, the, for the mobile device that you want to be on and set your permissions for Android and iOS respectively. So um, it's really cool. And uh, there's two approaches obviously with Adobe Air. There's HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, if, you, if you don't know that, uh, Adobe Air can actually just make an entire Air application directly out of those technologies exactly like PhoneGap. So you can use the command line tools for free and you can build all your HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript in whatever environment you want. So if you like using Dreamweaver, you can use that. If you like just using TextMate or whatever, you can use that. Um, or you can uh, take the ActionScript route. So that will obviously give you access to more of the, um, more of the, the APIs, like more native access. So it will get you closer to the device and it will get you a little, like, in my opinion, a lot more power for rendering and working with, working with data, like working with sound and things like that. So there are native extensions for Adobe Air. So if there is something that Adobe Air uh, and the high-level libraries that it provides does not give you, uh, you can write your own native extensions, which I think is pretty cool. And there's actually a little bit of a community um, growing up around this, kind of like a little cottage community about writing native extensions and sharing them so that developers have access to these native extensions. Um, and that would be sort of um, things like, you know, getting into the camera roll on the iPhone, even though I think it was included in, in 3.1 or something. But um, things like this come out all the time, so there is a way to make these native extensions. So uh, you're never really blocked off from anything. Uh, a single code base, truly. So you make, uh, unless you're using native extensions, that's why they're right there. Um, so basically, you just have a single code base and you only need to consider a few things. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a sec. And there's high level libraries for working with the device. So these I will talk about a little bit later in the development samples. So we're going to talk about just how high level is it, how easy is it to, um, how easy is it to actually get into these, these features on the device. And uh, obviously you've got your high level libraries for graphics, text, video, et cetera. So the best of both worlds, I kind of touched on that a little bit. You can develop an action script. You can get pretty, pretty great performance. Um, it won't be close to native performance until Air 3.2, which is going to probably happen in about the next couple of months. I'll talk a little bit more about why in a second. Uh, or you can develop with HTML5, so you leverage some technology that you already know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So action script would be if you want to do multimedia intensive apps, so you want to make some games, you want to do photo video galleries that are really smooth and fluid, uh, you're looking to do camera or image manipulation, um, any sort of filtering effects, uh, you want to make the next Instagram, this is sort of what you would have to do. Um, 
and uh, HTML5, CSS, and JS, it's sort of basic to-do apps. Uh, you know, or like these geolocation apps, you know, I, w I went here, I found my favorite restaurant, I want to give it five stars, I want to leave a little note about it. That's the kind of stuff that, uh, that would be great to, uh, to leverage these existing technologies and frameworks. There's lots of frameworks out there for super fast development um, and compile to a native application. So it's still based on web views, but it is sitting on the device like a native web, uh, a native application. So that's great news. Uh, Cross-platform support for device features. Um, what do I really mean about that? <laughs> um, oh yeah, so sorry, when you're, when you're using Adobe Air with uh, HTML5, CSS, and, and JS, uh, you do get hooks into, into the device features and stuff, but um, it's, it's similar to the phone gap stuff, so it's, it's like pre-canned stuff that you can use. Now you can't mix these approaches unless you're tricky, so uh, Stage WebView Bridge is sort of a project that, that's been on Google Code for a while. So it's, again, it's open source, it's out there. And basically Stage WebView in Adobe Air allows you to pop a WebView inside your Adobe Air application and just float it there as if it was a bitmap. And uh, you can actually jump into the WebView and, and start touching the page and everything like that. So you could actually um, create most of your menuing and, uh, and whatnot with your app with just HTML5 and uh, JavaScript. And then when it comes time to actually do that, the heavy intensive part, you could actually uh, hide the stage web view and, um, and basically do your intensive computation and then come back and save that file. So, there, there is a way to mix them, and uh, this is sort of this is kind of an exciting thing because you have access to basically showing showing websites inside your app as if it was a true native application. So this is great stuff. Um, so high level libraries for Adobe Air uh, for the mobile experience, you've got all of this and a little bit more, I believe. Uh, other libraries that you get for free, obviously, are you know you can use your flex components, you can use buttons, filters, color transformations, any almost anything you'd want to do. Uh, most of us might be Flash developers, and we'll, we understand that um, we can basically do a lot of a lot of very high level stuff very quickly because we can leverage the APIs here, uh, and they're fast and they're great and they work they work well. So. Let's talk a little bit about this. Exactly the same code base. So you want to develop once and you want to deploy everywhere. And there's no need for hacks across different platforms. So you don't need to really drill down um, and sort of, you know, if you're using HTML5, you might need to say, you know, if is iOS, if is Android, and then make some considerations there. Um, so you only need to consider with Air the screen size and the resolution, the menu layouts, and maybe the lowest common denominator for your performance. So if you're really pushing pushing the polygons in a, well, you, you won't be pushing the polygons yet, but soon you'll be pushing the polygons in Air 3.2, and if you're really doing that, you will only need to really consider what's the lowest device that will, that will run this and maybe put some settings in there to, to set the quality and stuff. Uh, you can do that now with stage quality. We all kind of should, uh, should know that from flash development. So deploy either Air app type, so HTML5 or ActionScript, from many platforms, so you've got all these tools at your disposal. I mentioned them a little bit before. Um, any IDE or, um, that you can imagine, and you can just use the command line tools to deploy it. Um, so the Adobe Debug Launcher will connect you to the simulators on your device, and the ADT, which is the Adobe Developer Tool, will allow you to actually publish the application and create a file that you're able to submit to the market. Just a quick comment too about this, about this whole idea of, of free, so how free is it? Well, I use a PC, I use Flash Develop, Flash Develop's free, the SDKs are free, I smash them together, I used, uh, I used ADT to uh, publish my, my app, I have like an Android app on the market just as, a, as an air test, and I put it up about eight months ago. It's just a, a crappy little space game, but uh, I just wanted to make sure I could get 30 frames per second on my phone, which is sort of the baseline for Air. It's an HTC Desire. It runs, um, it runs Air, but it is actually the lowest device that will run Air because it's uh, stuck at 2.2 um, and it's got the, the 800 by 480 screen, so, and it's got a 1 gigahertz processor, so it's kind of like the baseline model. Um, 
but yeah, it runs my, my little space game at uh, 30 frames per second. I've got about, at any given time, I've got about uh, maybe about 40, 50 bitmaps on the screen. Some are half the size of the screen, like they're huge. And uh, some are actually bigger than the screen, just a few of the background layers. And uh, yeah, I wanted to see if it would work, and I did it all for free, paid my $25 to Google, and I put it up there just as an experiment. So uh, I won't really talk about that. You can go to my website and find it later. But uh, let's, let's talk about performance issues because that's a, that's a big concern for people. So you, are, you aren't writing native code, right? You, you, don't, have, you don't have native access to uh, really low-level stuff inside the device. So you are writing code that is going to be interpreted at the runtime, and your, con your consideration is obviously, you know, can it do what I want it to do? Can it, can it run my game, the game that I imagine, right? So one of the hugest bottlenecks uh, right now is graphics. So rendering the full display list is slow. And what I mean by kind of a full display list would be a loaded one, right? You know, you've got movie clip contains movie clip, contains sprite, contains shape, contains bitmap, you know, whatever. Uh, actually, shapes can't contain bitmaps, but, you know, did anybody catch that? Um, anyway, so basically rendering this tree of display list items, it's very difficult uh, for the, for the runtime. So you want to you wanna kind of avoid that. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, rendering many vectors is super slow. So uh, the vectors involve a lot of math and running the, the interpreted code. It can be, it can be pretty cumbersome for, for the runtime. So the workarounds here to consider is uh, you know you draw your vectors to bitmaps at runtime. It works great. So you find out the size of the device. You have your vector. You just stretch up your vector in a shape object, and then you uh, use the bitmap data dot draw. Draw that into bitmap data. You have it saved inside your application, and you're you're off to the races. So two techniques here for getting around uh, rendering a full display list, so a display list with lots of depth to it, so you've got lots of different items containing items. So the, the first step is to basically not have a display list at all, so you blit bitmap images to the screen, and this is great for games, especially games that sort of look like retro games, 80 games, 80s games, games where you know, your character only needs to maybe be at eight orientations. Because when you're using blitting, you're going to be using copy pixels, which is a method where it only allows you to basically uh, cut pixels out of the screen and copy it to somewhere else, or sorry, cut pixels out of the bitmap and copy it to somewhere on the screen. And uh, I won't get into bit, uh, to bidding, but it basically, the, the key catch with blitting is that it's not practical if you need a lot of transformations or smooth transformations. So if you need things rotating and, and you know, if you have a physics engine in the thing, uh, it's, it's blitting is probably not going to be the solution. Um, if you got like a lot of bouncing cubes or, sorry, bouncing boxes, then it's probably not for you. But uh, there is another option, so, uh, and this is sort of the lesser known option, but uh, you have a flat display list with only bitmaps on the stage, and you swap the bitmap data to do your animations. So, uh, for example, I personally wrote for my, for my uh, space game that I put on the Android market, um, I, wrote a, uh, I wrote an image class, and it had a vector of bitmap data, and it actually extended bitmap, and uh, basically, uh, you use uh, tricky math. It's not that tricky if you just uh, take if you just take it slow. Uh, but basically, matrix transformations to put everything on the screen where it should be, and um, it's great all around performance. It allows you to do all the transformations except for the uh, fake 3D ones. Um, if you guys remember when those were introduced, you could kind of take a take a bitmap and sort of spin it on the screen like this. Um, it won't do those rotations, but it'll do every other sort of basic. Uh, matrix transformation that you need, so you can scale, you can um, you can scale, you can rotate, you can move it around the screen, and you can also change your alpha, uh, and, and it will not it will not really impact the performance. You're going to need to use GPU mode mode for that. GPU mode, GPU mode for that, and uh, for blitting, I've heard mixed mixed stories. You know, CPU mode, GPU mode. Uh, I think CPU mode works better for blitting because it's it's better for the CPU to just be copying pixels all the time. Uh, don't quite know, but uh, yeah. So those are your two techniques that you want to check out right now if you want to uh, if you want to sort of publish something soon. But if not, I would just wait for for what's going to happen, and I'll talk about that in a sec. 
So performance issues. So sound, I do look into sound every now and then, and uh, I'm mainly a graphics guy. But dynamic, dynamic generation of sound is possible, but it's very, it's very slow on mobile devices uh, when you're using air. Um, you, need to, uh, you need your own implementation if you want to do fast Fourier transforms. So if you want to make a live visualizer that will basically allow people to put their iPad in a room and it will just uh, analyze what's coming in the microphone and display graphics or, um, or anything like that, it, it's going to be slow uh, right now. I don't know if they're fixing that for Air 3.2. Haven't really looked at that. Not a huge sound guy. But uh, layering multiple preloaded sounds, it's bad. It doesn't sound good. So if you have a game and you've got, you know, maybe the potential that four sounds are going to get triggered right at once, uh, it's probably not going to sound that high quality. Um, that's just uh, what's going on with the runtime. Uh, there's overhead for sound and no access to the iOS file system. So if you want to make uh, an Adobe Air app that plays uh, MP3s from the iTunes library inside an iPhone or an iPad, it's not, uh, it's not out there yet. Uh, you could write your own native extension if you want to learn some Objective-C, but you could also just wait for someone else to write it for you. And that, that should be coming soon. So uh, that's just some sound performance issues. So let's talk about programming for a bit. So I just posted this up. You guys can take a look. I'll take a drink of water. No, <laughs> it, it's not my comic. It's XKCD. Yeah. Um, so I got a few of these in the talk. Um, XKCD is just a funny, funny web comic. Uh, it's just xkcd.com. Um, so, anyways, uh, let's talk about the actual, um, actual development samples. So, uh, I don't know what the skill level is of the of the people in this room, and and sorry if it's a little bit if it's a little bit basic for you. But I just want to walk through a few of these examples to sort of um, talk about kind of just how simple air development is and how, how it's nice to have some really, some really great high-level devices to, uh, sorry, high-level libraries to access all of the device's features. So um, let's talk about touch for a sec. So you import a few libraries. Um, if, and then it's a, it's a static call to the multi-touch library and you're basically asking it if the max touch points that exist is greater than zero, that lets you know that it's a multi-touch program. So you say, for, you, for the rest of your program, you say multi-touch is true, and you set the input, mo in, input mode to touch point. There's also touch gesture, and so you have access to sort of swipe gesture libraries and stuff. I won't talk about it uh, in this example, but uh, you do have access to, to a gesture library. Um, so you add some event listeners, and obviously you want your begin, your move, and your end. So it's just like, you know, it's just like the mouse stuff. And then uh, you know you make your uh, you make your public function to handle the touch move. It's actually a touch event. If you want to know what uh, what finger was touched, it's just going to be d dot touch point id. So for example, this little trace here is going to basically print out finger zero is here, and then it'll tell you the location of your finger. So not too exciting, but uh, it, you can see it's pretty easy to get up and get started like right away. And this is the dot, dot, dots are basically around your, whatever your main class is or whatever your game is. Um, so let's talk about the camera. Super simple. Um, you import camera, import video if you want to, if you want to show it on the screen. Um, camera equals camera dot get camera. So that's a, that's a static call to the camera class in air and uh, with a capital C. And uh, you say get camera, it puts it into your camera variable. If the camera is null, there is no camera installed. Uh, otherwise, there is a camera installed and you basically set the mode of your camera. So I've set it to half of my Android phone screen resolution, 15 frames per second, and uh, something is true that I forget what it, what it means, but I'm sure you can quickly find that with some code, code, uh, code completion there. Um, so optional. Uh, this will be improved in Air 3.2, which is why I wanted to talk about this example. So, 
sometimes it might be convenient to sort of filter your camera or, or put some sort of effect on it uh, live. And basically, bitmap data dot draw, you draw the video with a matrix and a color transformation, and basically you can filter the colors of the, of the incoming video um, and show just the bitmap on the screen and, and leave the video in the background by not adding the video object to the display list. So that, that is an option right now, and it's going to be improved with Air 3.2 it's going to be possible to actually attach the camera to a stage video object and to also basically get pixels out of the camera object super, super fast and um, into like a buffer and it, it'll be vastly improved. So uh, yeah, let's talk about the microphone. So um, pretty simple except working with sound is just, it's never fun. So it's just like the camera example. Once you get your microphone, you're basically set up, set up to go. I kind of squished it with um, add event listener there uh, in the square bracket. So I'm just looking down here now. And uh, basically what you're looking for on the microphone is an event listener. It's, a, uh, it's an event called the sample data event. And if you've ever worked with sound in, um, in flash or dynamic sound, it kind of works like this. So uh, basically the sample data comes in and um, mic.data contains a byte array of the sound data and you have to use like read float, write float to actually pass the data back to a, a dynamic sound object to get it to come back out of the speakers um, or you can write it to a, uh, to a wave file. Um, yeah, working with sound isn't, isn't the prettiest right now but I mean it's, uh, it's not too hard if you just sort of, there, there's tons of examples out there to help you out with it. So let's talk about the accelerometer. It's just like everything else. All of these examples are pretty much the same. Um, so, you know, you make a, uh, an accelerometer object. You ask, it's a little bit different. You ask, uh, you make a static call. You say accelerometer is supported. You see if that is true. So you're just checking that Boolean in the accelerometer class. And then if it is supported, then you make a new accelerometer. So it's a little bit different than the camera example. Just notice the construction here. It's just a little bit sort of flipped around. So now you make a new accelerometer if it is supported and you add an event listener to it and it's just the accelerometer event update. And then in the update event, you just grab, 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 grab your XYZ and you're off to the races. Um, so let's talk about orientation. Um, something that maybe nobody considers until the end and they think, hey, what if somebody flips, my, flips their phone while they're playing my game? Um, so basically you would, uh, you would add to the stage uh, one of two stage orientation events. Uh, you, can add, you can add whichever one you want. Um, one is going to happen when it's about to change and that's uh, the stage orientation event orientation changing that will fire when, uh, when the phone is detected to be turning um, to a different orientation or when it's just about to flip. And then when it has completed its, its flip, uh, it'll fire the orientation change event. And so here, just to handle the orientation change event, you've got uh, a switch statement and you're handling these four cases. So can't really be anywhere in between. So uh, yeah, you've got all your four cases and you can do sort of whatever you want with them. So, this is sort of where you would have to call maybe a, a main resize method and resize all of your, um, your menu elements and resize your, your backgrounds and your screen. So uh, SQLite. Um, so you, we want to obviously at some point, if you're making an app, you want to store something. So let's talk about SQLite. So you do need to import the Flash file system and uh, you want to import the SQL connection and the SQL statement um, libraries. And in this, uh, I just made this as an example of a public function, so I call it new connection. And basically, you're just looking to see if the file is there, and you make a new connection um, to the file. You open your connection, and then here, if you want to execute some SQL, this is just a rough example. Um, so you say execute SQL with SQL the string, and uh, I just kind of put it all in one line here, but it's new connection, statement text equals SQL, execute the statement, close the connection. So it's pretty quick, uh, pretty quick to set up the SQL stuff. There's, there's many examples out there that are really good. Um, the, the nice thing is uh, application storage directory resolve path. That's great because uh, it actually just sort of, it, you know, it finds the application directory for you. You don't need to do any searching and it just makes the database file and you're, you're ready to go. 
so uh, that's pretty pretty fluid as well. So here's another funny slide. <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the things that I, that I get really excited about, I do get excited about um, actually, actually the, the programming itself and actually making the system and making good code, clean code, and, and sort of making sure I can squeeze uh, everything I can out of, out of the system. So I'm going to talk about some performance tips, and actually I got these from uh, jackdunson.com, and I kind of knew, I kind of knew like, a little over half of these. Some of them I didn't really know, but um, his uh, his website's pretty good. He's a he's a super action script geek, and uh, he's really into this stuff. So you could check out his website if you'd like. Um, but I sort of changed the language a little bit to just make them a little bit easier to understand. So. You want to use the APIs that are available to you instead of redoing the same thing in ActionScript. Um, so that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, leverage things that are out there like, uh, like vectors, byte arrays, whatever is available to you um, through the APIs. They're geared to actually be really, really fast in the players. And so if you kind of re-engineer it on your own, um, it might, uh, might cause some issues. I'll, I'll say that with one caveat. Um, what is not available in the ActionScript API, and if you need, like, just if you're really obsessed with performance, um, linked lists actually perform, like, really well compared to, uh, compared to vectors. So vectors are great, but linked lists outperform them, uh, especially if you're doing a ton of stuff. So linked lists is just basically one object has a reference to the next object in the list, or uh, you could have doubly linked lists where they have the next and the previous object that came before them, and they actually perform super well. Now, the only thing you lose when you're iterating over linked lists is you lose that, that easy access, like grab me the element at position 274 and just return that. You'd have to actually go through the front of the list. Um, and uh, I think with vectors and stuff, that might outperform it, but uh, check it out for yourself. <laughs> Um, eliminate allocations to reduce the garbage collection. So there's a lot of uh, hidden allocations that go on. And what I mean by an allocation is basically when you use the word new, you're allocating stuff, okay? So uh, for, for a performance tip, you just want to eliminate that, especially within a game loop. You never really want to be saying new this, new that. It's pretty, it's pretty bad because you're basically just creating new stuff. and uh, that's really heavy on not only the ActionScript virtual machine, uh, just allocating things in general, it's going to be heavy on the garbage collection because at some point you're going to come back and collect those things. Uh, so you're, if you have a game loop and you're always sort of creating some enemies and then the enemies are getting killed and then they're flagged for garbage collection, even if you tidy up all your references, that methodology is pretty poor for a, a blistering fast game loop. So if you want a really great game loop, what you really want to do is have a bucket, and this sort of goes into the next, uh, this is number three now, reuse objects to reduce garbage collection. So really, if you have a game and you're in a level, you want to create everything that you need for that level, and you want to just have a rotating list of enemies. So uh, basically you'll have a bucket of 10 enemies that you can have at any one time, and you'll just want to bring them in, flag them as dead, and then take them off screen. And then what you do is you loop over your list of enemies and you say, okay, if you're dead, then bring you back on the screen, right? So it's basically a fixed size of everything when your game is running. So just uh, think about that. It's tough to get your head around it. and you're thinking to yourself, well, then I got to do a lot of bookkeeping. I can't just say new and have it pop out, right? But uh, it's the, the garbage collection and the allocation is going gonna, is gonna to actually hamper you in the end. It's much better to just maintain object pools. So it's the technical term in, in sort of computer science language is object pooling. So you want to just have pools of objects and never really put more water in the pool or have to take it out because it's, it's expensive. Do you leave them on this playlist or just to pull off? That's uh, that's not going to be that expensive. Uh, putting them on and off the display list as, as compared to like an allocation, but um, in my like in my opinion, I I just would leave my objects on the display list. I would set their visible property to false. 
uh, that basically makes them that basically makes the display list come by, check visible. If it's false, it just it just goes away. So uh, that's not really going to hamper performance if you leave them on. Uh, I think there might be some overhead in allocation. I've never had that. I've never even considered that scenario though. But uh, now I'm gonna, now I'm going to look it up. No. Even if visible is set to false. If visible, so if visible is set to false. Is there, is there a performance hit with just leaving your object attached to the display list? Uh, no, like I said, it's gonna, the display list is going to sweep by, uh, or you know, whatever draws the display list, it's going to sweep by and it's just going to see that visible is false and just skip over it. So checking a Boolean inside a loop, um, even if you have a bunch of things that are, that are not visible, uh, it's not, really, not going to impact performance. I think ripping them out and putting them back in will actually do more damage. Yeah. I've never had to actually remove them uh, from the display list to, to get more performance. So, good question though. Um, I never really considered it. I haven't heard anything about that. Like, sorry, if they're going yeah. to like a bitmap data, for example, um, are you taking a CPU hit by keeping them around on the CPU or um, keeping them in memory? Actually? Keeping them in memory? Um, so, yeah, you're definitely going to have if you do use object pooling and stuff, you're basically going to, you, when your level loads, you're going to have, your memory is just going to go like boing, and then it's going to sit there, right? Because you're not actually making anything new or taking anything away. So you won't really take a performance hit, but in terms of memory performance, you might take a little bit of hit if, you're, if you have tons of bitmap data uh, uh, staying there. In terms of adding or removing from the display list, it's still just, at the end of the day, it's just going to be in memory, so it's not really going to affect that much. Um, so the next point is uh, basically don't use anything dynamic. So don't use the object class, uh, the generic object class. Uh, don't use movie clip types. Um, don't use untyped variables, so don't pass parameters around with an asterisk and, and, just, and just have some figuring out in your code. Uh, although I still see some, some stuff uses that uh, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hugely impact performance. Um, so no, um, no array access type for, un, uh, for untyped fields. So use a typed vector. Don't just leave it up to Flash to figure out what type this, this, this crazy mix of stuff is. Um, so basically use typed vectors if you want to use, if you want to store lists of things. Um, offload to the GPU, that's kind of a given. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the sort of like the what's coming up section. Um, you want to reduce function calls via caching or inlining. So function calls in air uh, and just in the Flash platform uh, in general, they are expensive. Not many people consider this, but uh, basically function calls are, are expensive. So what you want to do is by caching, you want to cache uh, so, so if you have a getter or a setter and you have lots of values sort of constantly being returned all the time, what you can do is um, if you're already calling a function to update your, your camera object and your camera sets the matrix for the world, which will show you sort of where you are in the scene, then you can store that matrix as a, uh, as a, um, as a member in the, in the camera class and you can basically update it once instead of always calling and, and doing these matrix transformations and calling that function over and over and over. And then you can just actually, somewhere else in your code, you can avoid a function call to the camera get matrix. Um, I don't know if any of that makes sense, but basically you want to sort of try to pipeline things and, and bring, things, bring things to the forefront and cache function calls where you can. So that would just mean make the data once, store it as a member variable, access it uh, directly with another object, and, uh, and that'll hopefully improve some performance. Uh, function calls, yeah, they introduce a bit of an overhead. Again, how can you avoid having function calls in your program? <laughs> I mean, this, some of this stuff gets a little nuts. Uh, inlining is the act of bringing the code from the function directly into the loop itself that was calling the code. So, Inlining is just a, a way of bringing that code to the forefront. So let's say you were doing uh, a lot of um, position updating or something, you would bring that into your, into your main loop. You wouldn't have a function call for, you know, 
update acceleration, update velocity, update position. If those are like three separate function calls, why not just do all of that logic in one loop called update? So uh, that's something to consider. Um, use specific objects and functions versus general purpose ones. So uh, a bitmap and a shape, they're different beasts, but they are the lightweight guys. And then above that, you have the sprite, which may contain a bitmap or a sprite may have a graphics object as well. Uh, and then a greater than that is a movie clip. And movie clip is probably if you're making a game, guys, or if you're making just, whoa, take it easy. Um, if you're making a game and you're, uh, or you're just making an, uh, an app and you're really, con you're really concerned about performance, I mean, we should all just be forgetting about movie clips uh, nowadays because they're, they're kind of dead. Um, Right. That's a good question. It's twofold. So it, it is memory, but it is also at the end of the day, it, it's just display list performance. So uh, when the virtual machine's running through the display list, it's going to hit a movie clip object, and it actually has to make decisions about, uh, you know, whether or not its timelines being used. Whether, you know, so it has to sort of ask those questions. So at the end of the day, if you can kind of and, and a sprite, it actually, the display list has to check, do you have children, right? Bitmaps and shapes can't contain children, so by default, the display list sort of wipes over them and just uh, basically shoots them onto the screen and everybody's happy. So it's a performance issue kind of in just updating, but you're right, it's also a memory issue uh, completely because they can, they can contain anything, right? Movie clips are also dynamic by default in, in Flash, so, um, you know, you could actually make a new movie clip object and then attach just, you know, any sort of variable to it. You could just say movie clip dot my, my new variable and you could say equals 57 and then now sort of the virtual machine has to consider that that is a possibility. So whenever a virtual machine is looking through objects and looking through tables of what an object could potentially contain, which is, uh, you know, variables or member variables or fields, uh, then that, that lookup is expensive because it doesn't know what the type is of that variable. It doesn't know that it could have all these other dynamic variables. So that's just expensive lookups for the, for the virtual machine. So if you have a sprite on the stage, it was just basically a sprite with, with whatever. But it wasn't associated with a class. Um, and then you had a sprite that was associated with a class, so it has some, some methods associated with it. The one with the class would be more intensive more memory or take up more resources than the one without because of the extra baggage it has that you created? Uh, yep. Um, so are you, I just want to be clear, you're speaking about a class that extends the sprite object. That's right. Right. So if you have a class that extends the sprite object, yeah, it's going to build, it's going to build an extra table uh, on all of the existing properties of the sprite object. So sprites contain, you know, X, Y, um, alpha, and all this stuff. So it's going to create uh, basically an extended table for everything that your class is extending um, on that. And so, yeah, the, the lookup time and the performance hit is there. You can't, at the end of the day, like these are, these are, these are kind of, some of these are nutty and they're a little bit crazy. So you, you, have to, you have to use some of them. You have to use some of them. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, totally. So just, uh, you know, tread, tread softly. Um, but uh, these are just sort of, uh, you know, places to look for bottlenecks. Um, so you want to use less, uh, also you want to use less static accessors. Um, so uh, you, you can do that via storing a local reference. So um, we all do this uh, in Flash. We all say, you know, math.random. That's kind of hard to avoid. Um, I had in my, in my space game for, uh, for air, I was making a, um, I was making a lot of these and I actually didn't know that, that they were expensive. But uh, you can quickly and easily get around this by storing a uh, member variable that will be uh, that static access uh, function call. So 
it's not that hard. You store a member variable, you say that its type is a function, and then you basically can take the function that you use most frequently in your game loop, and you can actually uh, attach it once in the, in the initialization of that object, and basically um, that function will now be referenced through this local member variable, and it's, it's much faster uh, than a static lookup. So math.random, that is a static lookup uh, because it's, you know, capital M math. It might get highlighted in your IDE. Um, if you take math.random and you store it to just rand, the local variable, then if you're using these per frame, then you'll get some, some performance increase there. These are also, again, uh, I just want to preface this, micro-optimization. Op most, most of the time you might not need this stuff, but if you're finding that you've got some, um, some bottlenecks, then take a look at this stuff. <laughs> so storing, storing, you're storing it in like a function tank. Local. Yeah. And that's actually faster than a static call. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how much I don't know that I'm a performance freak. Uh, I'm learning a lot. I was reading that uh, that um, function calls to to variables like as they're actually sixty percent slower than uh, than static kind of like uh, function calls. Or really? Calls them, yeah. It was kind of surprising. Too. Okay, well, <laughs> that would be great, yeah. Or, or we could uh, we could get together and talk to Jack. Sure, that would be great. Yeah, and uh, guys, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not totally, uh, I'm not totally convinced by any of this. So I'm totally open to uh, a discussion, and I'd like to sort of facilitate that. So, uh, yeah, your your questions and comments are, are definitely appreciated. There's a few people out there who have actually done a lot of testing on this, and it's actually super easy to test yourself. Like you could just basically make a timer call before and after the function. You see how much, how many milliseconds does that lift? Elapse doing something and if you have a question as to whether something is slower if you recode it a different way, you can run it like this even if you want to really like push you can just run it ten thousand times to see which one will actually take longer. And it sounds it sounds like really hail, but surprisingly that in terms of games it makes a difference. Right? Yeah, it totally does. Um, I've seen a lot of those performance tests uh, around the net and actually that's sort of Jack wasn't the first one that that um, that mentioned this. Uh, I, I had seen it before, so um, I'm not sure about the static stuff. Uh, I mean, it might still be open to debate. It depends on, I guess, who's doing the test. Uh, you know, what version they have. Um, it, all of this stuff has to come out, right? It's uh, it's like any test uh, or any sort of any sort of stats uh, disclosure. So uh, another one: use local variables versus member variables. Um, if you're frequently ask it, uh, accessing them. So um, there's a lot of people who, um, who favor sort of, you know, you get into a really intensive, computationally intensive function and you want to work with color, for example. So you say, right when you get into the function, you say, you know, um, var r number, var g number, var b number. So you set up your RGB values and then you basically jump into a big loop and you're, and you're doing some computation. So, uh, that's going to that's going to play off a little bit better than using member variables, um, and that's only if you're really frequently accessing them. Uh, and then eliminate uh, pointless initializations and code. So um, this one's just kind of silly, but uh, you know your default value is going to be zero. So why would you say equals zero and, and things like that? But uh, obviously it's going to slow you down. You're initializing things. So. Um, that's, that's obviously, you know, hot, hot for debate, guys, performance tips. It's always people out there doing little micro-optimizations. Um, some of the obvious stuff, though, uh, I'd say the most salient points in this entire thing are basically don't use a movie clip, use a bitmap. That's, that should be fairly obvious. Uh, we'll talk about offloading to the GPU in a second. Um, dynamic stuff, actually, uh, it does hurt a little bit. Um, and the reuse objects, uh, that, that's big. So object pooling should be 
sort of your, your method of choice. You know, load a level, load everything you may need to see in that level at once, and then basically play the level out to its completion, whether you died or whether you got to the next level, um, and then basically trash all of that and make a new level. Um, so that's sort of the, the favorite approach. So everything in the level should sit in the pool and you should never be making new memory. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about what's broken at Adobe in my opinion. Um, so I have like a few, I have a few gripes. Uh, I'm not really a fanboy. I don't really, I don't really care if you guys leave here being like, yay, air, or if you're like, hey, I'm going to go get the Corona SDK. Screw you. You know, um, I don't really care, uh, but uh, I, because I, I have some, I have some problems with Adobe too. So uh, what, I, what do I think is broken? Well, there's a few things. There's basically player release dates. Uh, we got no clue what's going on, right? Like as a, as a Flash developer, as an Air developer, we don't know what's happening. We don't know when it's dropping. We know that uh, Adobe Air 3.2 Beta 5 is out now for desktop for, for both Windows and Mac. Um, that's really cool. They're adding a lot of great stuff. They're doing great work. But uh, we know that beta 5 is the last beta. So the final release is next, but when is it? We have no idea. So that sort of bothers me from time to time because I'd like to know, uh, especially Air 3.2 will include uh, Stage 3D for mobile. And I want to know when they, when they plan on doing that. So um, player release information. So. Uh, what is going to be included in, in the releases, right? Will, will Stage 3D, in fact, be ready? Um, I actually, <laughs> I just Googled around, I don't advocate this, but I Googled around for Adobe Air 3.2 APK for Android, and I found it on some media fire site, and I downloaded it, and uh, I started to use it. Clearly, it wasn't optimized for my phone. My phone sort of, like I mentioned, my phone sort of like the baseline for Air. Wasn't optimized for my phone, but I did get some Stage 3D stuff actually showing up, but it was reverting to the Stage 3D uh, CPU mode. Um, uh, I can talk about that a little bit more when we talk about Stage 3D. But um, basically, Stage 3D is there. Like, it's like ready to go for mobile. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's out for desktop already. If you guys haven't tried Flash Sites with, with Stage 3D yet, I mean, it's, it's pretty slick. It's, uh, it's awesome. And then Threads, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. Um, they are coming. It's probably going to take to like 2013, but it'll, it'll come eventually. Um, I personally, I like the Adobe Evangelist uh, program. I think it's a cool program, but I do not like the fact that it sort of puts a bunch of sort of general purpose coders and hobbyists at a higher than thou sort of platform. Um, so I don't really think it's the best way to sort of foster a open source community approach. Um, and Adobe, I know um, they acquired uh, Nitobi, which makes PhoneGap, and basically Part of the discussion in the, in the acquisition was that Natobi fosters this awesome open source community and uh, Adobe is looking to do more of that. So Adobe is looking to actually get more open source to get, uh, to, to embrace the community a little bit more. And so the evangelist program sort of puts a layer there, you know, where you kind of have to, if you want to find out what's going on, you're never going to hear from someone at Adobe, but you've got to cobble it together from all of these blog posts and blog comments from, from some, of the, some of these evangelist guys. So that's sort of what, I, what I've been doing in the last year. I've been trying to really get a, a, clear, a clear signal from what's going on. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that I think is uh, kind of broken is the beta program. So uh, the beta program is basically beta releases of the um, air, of the air runtime for Android devices, for iOS, uh, being able to sort of test these beta programs. I mean, the desktop betas are out there, um, but as far as the development, um, like the desktop beta of Air 3.2 SDK, sorry, uh, I'll rephrase that. The beta of the Adobe Air 3.2 runtime is out for desktops, and that's great. We can, te we can test it, but the SDK is not there. So how do you test something that you can't develop for, right? So you're, you're kind of stuck there, right? Because like, you want access to all this cool stuff, but you can't actually get into it, right? So the beta program's a little effed right now, in my opinion. Um, and there's, there's, where's the clear direction, right? Like, I mean, they talk, 
they talk in sort of, um, I guess, like, like kind of highfalutin corporate talk sometimes about, you know, this is what we want, this is what we envision, right? But they're not very clear about just laying out a roadmap, like we're going to be here at this time, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I would like to hear that, um, and sorry, those are just my feelings, a little bit of a, little bit of a rant there. Um, so what am I excited about, uh, and what should you guys be excited about? Um, Stage 3D for mobile, so this is a game, the game changer. So you can actually make graphics that are fully GPU accelerated. You don't just run your app in GPU mode and hope for the best. Um, uh, you can actually actually get low level access. It, it's great, it's, it's pretty cool, it works great on the desktop. Um, and it'll be the exact same code, the exact same API across all devices. There are tons of great high level frameworks <clears throat> that are coming out right now that support Stage 3D already. Um, Starling, um, uh, these are all for 2D, sorry, by the way. There's Starling and there's uh, N2D2 and there's uh, our N2D2D or ND2D, I don't know, something like that. You'll find it. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's lots of 2D ones. Then there's also, of course, a, you know, a Way 3D and the Paper Vision guys. Um, I think they're still, they're still working on stuff like this. So I'm not huge into the 3D space, but definitely you will be able to get great, uh, some great 3D performance out of mobile devices using Air, using Stage 3D. I'm really excited about it. I hope that this beta uh, wasn't just a joke, and I hope that they actually get, get it ready for Air 3.2. It'll pretty much be a monumental release then, um, because it'll let us all really leverage the graphics of, of a mobile device. Um, so camera and stage video, I'm really uh, kind of excited because you'll be able to attach a camera to a stage video object for GPU accelerated uh, camera video, which will free you up uh, to basically do all sorts of pixel manipulations. And there are some exciting new ways to copy and manipulate pixels that are coming out, which is great. Um, so threads, you can read Matthew Fab's blog. Um, and basically, uh, there is a specification for it. They're, they're, they're in the works. They're, they're sort of turning the wheels on it. Um, if anybody doesn't know threads, concurrency, things like that, you've got your application. You've got a slick UI. Um, but then you have, to, you have to jump over somewhere and do some heavy computation. And while you're doing that, the user waves their mouse over the UI and none of the buttons hover states are working and you're, they're confused, they don't know what's going on because you're crunching some image over here. That's basically uh, what happens now and, and threads will sort of help alleviate a lot of that. You get faster, more responsive UIs in your applications and um, it'll be based on web workers and HTML5. It's taking forever to get here, um, you know, just a little bit. I, I really wish that was here. Now, uh, GPU parallelism, uh, yeah, it's for the crazy people, but basically Pixel Blender lets you run these really cool filters super fast because they use the GPU and they basically split the work up super parallel. GPUs have lots of cores, so you might, you might think that four cores is a lot, but GPUs have, you know, sometimes uh, a thousand. Um, and so, uh, they have a thousand really small little math cores, little math uh, machines, and basically uh, Pixel Blender will actually let you right now write filters for images that do that, but what is going to be coming is expanding that to general purpose code. So you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to maybe uh, potentially in one or two years leverage a physics library that is written with this kind of code that will actually um, run the physics as a parallel process on the GPU, which will actually run way, way faster than, than current sort of physics implementations. So something to, something to look for, but it's kind of crazy down the road. Uh, it was actually a sneak, a sneak peek at Max 2011 back in, um, I can't remember when it was. Um, so yeah, so summary. So when you're seeking to target mobile platforms, there's lots of platforms and there's lots of technologies to target them. So you want to understand who and what you're developing for and understand the capabilities of a chosen technology. So the licensing, the community, the documentation, and the developers that may be out there to help you um, or the developers that you want to hire. Um, I personally like to develop with free, mostly open tools. Uh, I like to leverage high-level libraries that work well. 
I like to control precisely how my application looks and behaves, and I want to have access to fast, sometimes low-level graphics, because I like graphics. Um, and then, just my little disclaimer at the bottom. Um, yeah, so uh, that's about it for the talk, and I'd really uh, be happy if people have the time, you want to stick around, you want to ask some questions, that would be great. And uh, could you turn the lights on, actually? That'd be great. And uh, yeah, so questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the comment is, you know, Unity uh, publishing to Stage 3D, publishing to Flash website. That's that's mainly a Unity penetration issue, I think. At that point, um, the Unity player is sort of like a heavy download for people. People already have Flash. It's already up to date. So, uh, yeah, Unity is just sort of looking at proliferation there, trying to sort of spread spread it out. It, it works great, though. I've heard really good reviews about it, and. Uh, Unity has got a lot of smart people working for them. Yeah. So anybody else have uh, any questions or comments about anything? Um, you know, apologies if the talk sort of jumped around. It was sort of kind of a, a catch-all sort of discussion. Um, okay, so it's kind of a it's kind of a question about about um, about rendering and animating. Yeah. Like, how would you do that? So, um, you want to get your bitmaps on the screen. You want to position them. You want to change the rotation. You want to scale them. You want to change their alpha, and maybe well, you can't do color transformations on the fly because it'll just destroy your application. So don't do that. But basically, there's a few transformations that you want to do, right? Um, so, uh, it's sort of a two-fold question. So, how would you do that sort of in a fast technique that lets you take advantage of all the transformations? Well, you want to use bitmaps and you want to use the, uh, the matrix class and the, it's the, um, it's the bitmap, uh, bitmap transform. Uh, it's like bitmap.transform. Uh, dot matrix, and then you say that it equals your new matrix where you want your bitmap to be, how you want it to look. So you're, you're manipulating basically matrices and you're basically copying them and swapping them. And that's just, that's just a little bit of math and those matrices are set up to work really fast. So that will actually allow you to position your bitmap, scale them from the center, or do a bunch of stuff. I'll quickly can show you guys something if you, if you want to take a quick peek. Um, so that's part, of, that's part of it, but then animating. So how do you actually get a character to sort of do a walk cycle um, and, uh, and sort of walk through, walk through an animation sequence, like a step sequence? Um, I'll just find the correct, here's the image class. So um, it's a little bit bloated because I'm using it for a specific, a specific app. Um, and basically down here, where is it? Here's me initializing my bitmap data, um, and basically I have a I have an add frame method which will basically push new bitmap data into a vector. So you're just pushing uh, frames of animation, right? And then uh, you have your your animation index. So what 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 index am I at in my list of fr of animation frames? And uh, there's a set image where you can you can swap the bitmap data. So bitmap data here, this, uh, this local member um, or this member variable, it actually refers to the image class extends bitmap. So that lowercase bitmap data is actually in fact the bitmap data of this image class. So it does extend. Um, and then in an update, so 
if your animation speed is not zero, so if your animation speed is actually something, then you will animate and then animate. Uh, I have it so you can actually slow down. You can have an animation happen, you know, two times per sec or two times, sorry. <laughs> you can have an animation happen every second frame, every third frame, every fourth frame if you'd like and that's sort of how you step it. And um, in the draw, it's just some matrix stuff. So um, I have a matrix stored apparently uh, since I've been reading some of the performance stuff, this might not be the best way to do it, but it works super fast, so don't worry. Um, and for a draw, I, I'm hooked up to, I'm hooked up to physics entities and stuff like that, so maybe like the P's and the X's and the, the scales, I don't know, um, but might not make much sense. Every, on, on, on draw there, you're not caching the rotation No, I'm not caching the rotations, I'm just doing them all the time. And so, with this technique, so, so the, the technique's twofold, um, and uh, the technique's twofold, and basically um, with the technique, my, like my recommendation is, is basically if you need smooth transformations, uh, you're going to want to use this technique. With the technique, you're just basically putting bitmaps on the screen, manipulating them with transformations. If you need to animate, you're basically have, you basically have a vector of all the bitmap data that you would need and you're just, you're just copying it into the actual bitmap data that is part of the display list. So you have a one bitmap added to the display list and just copy bitmap data, right? Um, that's actually the, it's the fastest technique I've found. Um, it's been, uh, it's been used by uh, people on iOS and they've achieved, um, they've achieved great performance, you know, uh, sometimes 50 frames per second with, uh, with like, you know, with 50 frames per second with 50 bitmaps on the screen and a big background image covering the entire screen on a iPod touch that has a retina display and, and things are moving and rotating and scaling and alpha's going in and out and those are just tests. Um, those are just friends of mine that I've talked to. So um, yeah, I'm just, I'm interested in that technique because I like to work with, uh, with, I like to work with sort of like smooth rotations and I like to be able to scale things if I want. The blitting technique kind of pigeonholes you into uh, basically having to pre-rotate everything and nobody's going to pre-rotate 360 degree rotations. I mean, that's going to be kind of a memory nightmare. So, yeah. So there are, th and that rendering technique's sort of been covered on the internet, like, pretty extensively. Yeah. Is there uh, much difference when you go from platform to platform? I wonder if you guys have done some um, iOS development here published to it. And I was developing some prototypes for work on a database. They're pretty demanding. Um, there's not, there's not a huge difference. Most of these, uh, like this technique, for example, works great on Android. It works great on iOS. Uh, it works great on the BlackBerry tablet. Um, the, con the consideration is the fact that basically some Android phones are not going to have the kind of GPU that the, uh, that the iPhone would have. Um, so you're just looking at the device itself will be, will be limiting you a little bit. So yeah, you're going to want to test at the end of the day, obviously, before you release. But um, the, the Android phones coming out nowadays, like the higher end ones, um, they're looking a lot better. Although my friend's comment is basically that uh, Android experiences a lot of growth at the low end of the market. So some of these phones that are coming out, like the cheap phones, are just, they're, they're totally off the air spectrum completely. So they won't, they won't even run Adobe Air. So that's sort of, uh, that is a consideration. Um, and at that point, it's, it's a device specific um, sort of consideration. I mean, my phone has a, uh, the processor was basically made in the, in the last quarter of 2008, and it's pretty old then, uh, if that's when it was developed. And it's just a one gigahertz Snapdragon from way, way back. And it's the same one that's in the, the, the first Nexus phone that came out. Um, so yeah, it's pretty old, but it runs air. It runs it pretty good. And uh, I mean, my space game runs at like 30 frames per second on my phone. And I've actually used it on, I've used it on some of the newer phones that are out there. And it's just, it's 
blisteringly fast. So I think moving forward, um, moving forward, it's going to become less and less of an issue. The lines will blur a little bit more, but uh, I, I'm hoping that basically stage 3D will alleviate a lot of that. Um, and if you're leveraging one of these uh, one of these 2D frameworks for stage 3D, like Starling or ND2D, that's the correct name then basically you're going to get some great, great performance. And you're going to be able to work with things as if you were just working with sprites. Um, and so you won't have to know any of the low level details. You had a question? Yeah. Um, I'm an interaction designer, and that's why um, I, I don't know any interaction scripts. I don't code the whole thing, but I think you use MX and all of them. You can find it how far you can get in that. Um, it kind of goes back, uh, so the question is basically, if I understand it, <laughs> it's basically, you know, do, does, it, does using XML components introduce a lot of overhead? Um, is that sort of like the gist of it? Sure. Okay. Um, so it kind of goes back to the debate of why would you use a movie clip if you don't need everything that a movie clip offers? So um, the the, I, as far as I know, like, you know, generic flex components, uh, like list views and, um, you know, forms and things like that, um, they don't actually perform that, like, blisteringly well because, uh, blisteringly fast, I'm saying that a lot today, um, they don't actually perform, uh, you know, to the effect that it would, it would if, you, if you just coded your own sort of specific single purpose uh, component, uh, because they have to consider the use cases of, you know, having many different, uh, different sort of scenarios that could happen uh, to this one component. So that, that's all you're going to get is just a little bit of bulk with that. Um, if you're really concerned about performance, um, yeah, you know, you, you might want to roll your own, but, uh, or you might want to try to, uh, you could sort of step into it by making making your, your interface out of basically the smallest, simplest XML components that you could find, MXML. Um, but uh, personally, I haven't done a ton of development with the MXML stuff. I have used uh, like the list views before and, and stuff like that. And I've noticed that, you know, yeah, scrolling is a little sluggish or, or something like that um, when you've got lots of items. But uh, yeah. I don't really have a lot of details. Does anybody else have any experience with sort of flex components? I can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, especially in uh, earlier releases, uh, like latest releases, they've redone a lot of the components to the use. Like, hey, it comes back to actually what Matt said earlier about basically the use of the display list, like the components that we have, you know, yeah. children and the display list, right? So that's where you lose a lot of the components. Um, some of the newer components have been built to sort of ground up to, you know, not go too deep into the display of this. So everything's like uh, 2.5 release uh, of air, um, like the components that's kind of reworked in. It's actually pretty good, but it's still not. They're kind of heavy. Right. They're, they're right. written for um, a lot, like you were saying, a lot. They, they, they have so much baggage entailed in there that they're just heavy. Um, if, if you want to light it up, you can write, like, write your own just so that you can do it to a unique case specific and it doesn't have to take care of everything. Right? I mean, I can understand well, how they, why they were like that. It isn't necessarily, it's, it's, it's like shotgun blast as opposed to a laser. Right? Yeah. And, and for a while, you know, development using flex and air, was, you know, we weren't worried about the devices. So load got pretty big and we depended a lot on
you know, and then maybe you have some help to certain performance tweaks on it to get them there. It's good for that for sure. Thanks. Yeah. How do you feel about the um, the TSMC and Adobe Air Runtime um, on like the cloud side? I think it would be new release coming up. Is it going to be heavier? Or I think it gives you about like about four megabytes. Yeah. Um, so when you're uh, when you're uh, developing Adobe Air applications for Android, it's actually the download on an Android device, and it ends up being it ends up sitting on the device uh, at about 16 megabytes or something. But you can actually uh, move it to the SD card. So I mean, no, now now it's you don't you don't have to um, download it. With Air 3.2 or 3.1? Yeah. Oh, I still have it as a runtime, but even on Android? Yeah. Really? I think so. Or do you maybe you have that option or something? Um, yeah. I I know on uh, I know on iOS it is rolled in. Yeah. It's like rolled it's rolled in as if it was sort of like back in the day you know a flash projector you would uh, you would save it up as an EXE um, or or like a like an app. File on a Mac, and it would just run because it had the flash, the flash environment or the flash runtime in it. Um, that's not even in the device that we're using. Uh, that what device were you using? I was using a, um, it was a Nexus um, phone. Wow. Oh. Just like something where it can like play it on. Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to get around that. Um, but yeah, if it's going to be rolled in, it's going to be you know about four megabytes. But if it's uh, like right now, I'm I'm sitting with the Android runtime on my phone and it's 16 megabytes, and uh, I'm putting test applications onto it that are like you know 60 kilobytes because I'm just testing there. But um, yeah, uh, I mean, what are the other? I mean, I I don't know. I I don't see that. I don't see that as a huge concern personally. But um, I think that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, take, take a look at your your iOS, like the size of the app. Some of them are like. Some of the games are almost like EA. Like if you look at like I'm yeah. EA, if you if you get the soccer game, it's like almost like EA needs to download. Your average game is like 118 meg, so 16 meg is not. Right? Yeah, I, I but downloaded. It's over 20 though, then then people can. Yeah, they have to. They, well, they have to go to Wi-Fi. Right? Yeah, it's, it's sort of if you want, if people are like, well, okay, I want to get that app right now, and then not have to go to the Wi-Fi. I know you can save. You can save just a ton of room if you if all of your art is uh, loaded into the Swift or whatever when it's compiled into the Swift. If it's vectors, but then converted to bitmaps, you just save ridiculous amounts of space. So that that's obviously a tactic. Um, but then you have to have vector art to begin with. So yeah. Some games they'll, they'll load in levels as you go go through it. So the, the actual initial load is. Not too bad, but then as you go through levels, it would actually call for more assets. Yeah. How difficult is it to actually um, save those assets? Like, it seems to save pieces to the device. Oh yeah, you can save them to the application storage. Is it, is it difficult, or is it? Uh, well, the SQL, like the SQL database stuff, not difficult. Um, like, I mean, storing to the SQL database, but, but the only problem with that is with SQLite, you're limited to about five megabytes. That's like the recommended. So that's just data. It's not images. You don't want to stuff images in there. But you could store, you know, like level sort of level, level information, like a descriptor of the level, uh, as, like in that. So if, you're, if your levels are described with some other sort of language like XML, you could store that in the, the SQLite database and store, you know, tons of levels. And then your images could just be called from uh, from the actual application storage directory. So you can Adobe Air apps can just dump images into the application storage directory. Totally possible. You could dump anything in there. You could dump recorded sound of the microphone. So yeah, it's totally an option to um, you know connect to a service and say say to your user, you know, do you want to continue playing and connect to a service, and then they they download the level, take them you know a few minutes. Uh, to get some some image data and some a descriptor of the level, and then boom, you're you're ready to go. Does the cloud play into anything? Like I know they're talking about basically working with cloud storage for everybody. Ideally, 
does that play into anything with air, where it's going? Um, air doesn't have anything really specific set up for that right now. Um, what I would like to see personally is I'd like to see, you know, direct, because uh, we can already write SQL statements to SQLite databases, but I'd like to see it being able to go directly to a remote, uh, like a remote database, but um, there's security stuff involved in that. And um, so you got to go through a, a middle language like PHP. Uh, I, I wrote I wrote some air apps just to test some stuff that would connect to uh, to my to my web server and uh, out in the cloud, you know, um, and, and just basically do some insert stuff and and, and rip some data back out um, just for some simple load save stuff. It's not uh, it's not crazy. It's not out of the question. But as far as like you know, air having some sort of specific sort of cloud implementations, like is it going to hook up to uh, to iCloud or whatever, uh, is that going to be rolled in? <laughs> yeah, not sure. But I mean, there's obviously going to be like tons of libraries out there to facilitate you. The one thing that's nice about um, about the Air stuff is that you know, Stage 3D isn't even out for mobile. It's only been out for the desktop for like you know a matter of months. But there's already frameworks uh, to work with it, and and to be able to ignore the low-level details but leverage the power. And that, that's what's really cool about the community. So um, there's a lot of good work being done and, um, and it's, it's a huge base. Yeah. So again, yeah, I just <laughs> I wanted to preface this whole talk with, uh, I'll sort of reverse preface it with, uh, I, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert, guys. I don't have connections at Adobe, but I have been very, very interested in this for, for a long time because uh, I'm just a single developer and I want to make some, I want to make some, some applications and I want to have, I want to have the ability to basically not have to, not have to completely port something if, uh, if I stumble across an application that I'm particularly passionate about and I want to get it out everywhere. So, um, yeah. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, my, um, I'll be uploading the slides. Uh, if you missed anything, I'll be uploading the slides. And I've been recording my voice, so I'm going to spice it all together to a YouTube video and, and just throw it up in the next couple of days. So, um, yeah, it was a pleasure, and, and not 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 much was else was happening with the the Flash group. So I thought we would just get something going. Um, yeah, no problem. <laughs>